The theme for the year seems to be revolving around those about whom very little is known. And today is no exception. So join me as we talk about a person who is used of God to lead a preacher to Christ, but about whom little is known. Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. Before we dive into the episode and start talking about specifically the person uh, who this episode is about, I want to lay a little bit of background for us. So if you join me this summer, uh, we read through D.L. Moody's biography, 14 weeks of content there, and I believe it was 48 chapters. During that reading, you may remember at the very beginning that Moody's father died when D.L. Moody was very young. And he had many other men in his life, his brothers, uncles, and employers, who aided him in becoming a conscientious young man. Now we know that church attendance was not a debatable question in his family, but it was as inevitable as a law of nature. So the influence of his family, and his mother in particular, had a tremendous impact on young Moody's life. Yet, even with weekly church attendance and daily devotions, it did not click for Moody that he was in need of a savior. That it was for him, Dwight Lyman Moody, that Christ had died on the cross to pay for his sin. That realization would come later. But from the age of 10, Moody began to work away from home. He did farm work, delivered paper, hauled, and cut logs. Before he finally exclaimed to his brother Edwin one day, I'm tired of this. I'm not going to stay here any longer. I'm going to the city. Seems to be a common cry throughout the that era of people just wanting to go somewhere else. This still happens today. People are like, hey, I live in a small town. I want to go to Nashville or Los Angeles or New York. We still have this interest in big cities. So regardless, that was Moody's thing. And so the city Moody intended to go to was Boston. It was close by, so he went to Boston. Now his family strongly opposed his going to Boston, as no one believed that he had any special qualification for a successful career in the city. The cities, they understood, were full of young men looking for positions, while at Northfield, where he lived, he was at least assured of steady work on the farms. But young Moody had made up his mind that the one thing for him to do was to go to Boston, and in spite of all obstacles, make a career for himself. Well, Moody floundered in the big city for a week, and though he had two uncles with businesses in the city, neither offered him a job. He assumed that they would come to him to offer employment. One of his uncles ventured to offer him a little advice after they saw that he was struggling. And this uncle told him that his self-will was greatly in his way, and that modesty was sometimes as needful as courage, and suggested that his other uncle, Uncle Samuel Holton, would no doubt be glad to do something for him if he would show himself a little more willing to be governed by people who were older and wiser than himself. Well, 17-year-old Moody swallowed his young pride and asked his uncle, Samuel Holton, for a place in his shoe shop. Well, his uncle offered him a place, but on the following conditions. He said, now, my men here want to do their work as I want it done. If you want to come in here and do the best you can, and do it right, and if you're willing to ask whenever you don't know, and if you promise to go to church and Sunday school, and if you will not go anywhere that you wouldn't want your mother to know about, we'll see how we can get along. You can have until Monday to think it over. I don't want till Monday was the prompt response. I'll promise now. And this started to set in motion steps that would lead towards Moody's conversion. This uncle, Samuel Holton, puts him in a position where, hey, if you're going to work for me, great. But you're going to go to church and Sunday school. And this leads him to the Mount Vernon Congregational Church, where he was enrolled in the Sunday school class of a Mr. Edward Kimball, and this is who we want to talk about today. I'm not sure exactly, actually now, as I think about it, if they pronounce it as Kimball or Kimball. It's probably more Kimball, because it's spelled K-I-M-B-A-L-L. It's probably more Kimball. I'll try to pronounce it that way. And let's talk briefly about this man. Edward Kimball was born in Raleigh, Massachusetts on July 29th, 1823. He received a common school education and later attended local academies. His parents had intended he should study for the ministry, but his health at that time prevented it. His father was a teacher in the public schools at Rowley, and his son succeeded him. When he was 23 years of age, he went to Boston and engaged in the carpet business. He became the first traveling salesman in the country to handle carpets outside of the local territory. And he also became the head of a large carpet house in Boston. Now, in addition to the work that he was doing throughout the week, Mr. Kimball volunteered his time as a Sunday school teacher at the Mount Vernon Congregational Church. 
I'm not sure how long Mr. Kimball had been teaching Sunday school when Moody began to attend, nor do I know how long Moody attended before some things began to change. So let me explain a little bit. When Moody came to the Sunday school, he didn't know where the book of John was. There's a story recounted that Mr. Kimball said, you know, turn to the book of John, and everyone else knew exactly where that was, and Moody was back in the Old Testament trying to find the book of John. And Mr. Kimball helped him out, but realized that he didn't know a lot about the Bible, where things were. So we learn that Mr. Kimball took an interest in young Moody. This young man who was far away from home, living in a big city for the first time, but who's very much still a farm boy. And so he took an interest and saw something in this young man. Now, from the book, The Life of Dale Moody, written by his son, we find a recounting of, by Mr. Kimball of the story of Dale Moody's conversion. Because up to this point, Mr. Kimball had been gradually leading the young man to a fuller knowledge of God's plan of salvation. But he, Moody hadn't made that choice yet. And he needed, Mr. Kimball thought, maybe an additional personal interview to bring him to that decision that he needed Christ. Mr. Kimball may have seen something that Moody, in a group setting, maybe he wasn't getting it. Maybe he needed that personal interaction. And so Mr. Kimball went to Moody's place of business to speak with him. And here is that recounting. It says, I determined to speak to him about Christ and about his soul and started down to Holton's shoe store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to go in just then during business hours. I thought that possibly my call might embarrass the boy, and that when I went away, the other clerks would ask where I was, and taunt him with my efforts in trying to make him a good boy. In the meantime, I had passed the store, and discovering this, I determined to make a dash for it, and have it over at once. I found Moody in the back part of the building, wrapping up shoes. I went up to him at once, and putting my hand on his shoulder, I made what, what I afterwards thought was a very weak plea for Christ. I don't know just what words I used, nor could Mr. Moody tell. I simply told him of Christ's love for him and the love Christ wanted in return. That was all there was. It seemed the young man was just ready for the light that then broke upon him. And there, in the back of that store in Boston, he gave himself and his life to Christ. Mr. Kimball's interest in his young men, the, the men that he taught in Sunday school, went beyond just that hour, hour and a half, however long they had Sunday school at the time. It, it went beyond that time frame to the point that he was willing to, on a Saturday, his time off, to go and speak one-on-one -on -one with Moody. You could tell that Moody was close, that he hadn't fully grasped the need of salvation yet, but that he was close. And so Mr. Kimball went and personally spoke with him. If you're thinking about Sunday school teachers and people who are working with, whether it's children, teenagers, adults even, having that personal interaction, you know, to not just be interested in someone during that scheduled set time during Sunday school or a small group time, but going beyond that. If you're thinking about them one day, to send them a text message or to give them a phone call or to try to set up a meeting to go and talk with them. It might not work out as well today to go unannounced to their place of work and speak to them. Some businesses, that might be fine. You could do that. Um, you, and that wouldn't be bad. If you know that, let's say, a young person, let's say they work at Starbucks, and you're like, hey, I'm just going to go and order a coffee and say hello and give some words of encouragement. That would be a great thing to do. If you, if you know where they work, if you know that maybe they're struggling with the work environment that they're at, if you could go and just be there for a brief moment as a reminder of, hey, there's someone who cares about you that could be a great thing. It's the small things that make a big impact and help people to know that you care about them. It's it's so easy and so insincere. We can just send a text message and that's a good thing to do, but it can be so insincere. That phone call, that showing up to see them uh, can make a very, very big impact on showing someone, especially someone that someone who isn't saved yet, you can make that impact that you show that you care about them is very important. Now, this is what Edward Kimball is mainly known for today. He's known for being the person that God used to help Moody see his need of salvation. And there's this whole line of people from Edward Kimball to Dwight Moody down to Billy Graham that we'll talk about at some point in the future, potentially. This whole line of preachers, just one after another who was saved. You know, this one person was saved from D.L. Moody's work and then the next and the next and the next down to uh, Billy Graham. But Edward Kimball did more than that. And, you know, we don't know the impact that he had on his other students. We don't know who any of his other students were. That would be an interesting fact to know. Who else did Edward Kimball have an impact on? Because Dwight L. Moody was the most prominent, the most visible person that he had an impact on. Who else did he have an impact on? Someone who maybe was behind the scenes. Someone who had a smaller position. Someone who maybe was just faithful in his church every week. We don't know who those people were. 
but I'm sure if he had an impact on Moody, then he had an impact on others as well. But he didn't just have an impact on individuals. He also had an impact on churches as a whole. Mr. Kimball was a resident of Boston for more than 50 years, and he served and worked at Mount Vernon School for quite a long time. But he had another peculiar task that would take up the last 25 years of his life. This task, this, this work that he did, the inspiration came while he was on a business tour of the Pacific States. While representing the firm of A.H. Andrews and Company of Chicago in San Francisco in 1875, he assisted in the work of the Westminster Presbyterian Church and Mission. In the absence of a pastor, he occupied the pulpit several times, and shortly before the time of his departure, he decided to make an effort to clear away the debt that practically had overwhelmed the church. In a meeting he had with the church, the forceful eloquence of this layman accomplished the task that had proved futile to the clergy, and Mr. Kimball was successful in helping the church declare their debt. With the success, he decided to devote himself solely to the work of freeing churches from debt. Now, the amount of church debts raised by him since that time, 1875, had been estimated at more than between 10 and 15 million dollars. Among the churches that have been aided by Mr. Kimball's efforts are the Lincoln Park and the Union Park Congregational Churches, the Emanuel Baptist Churches of Chicago, and the largest debt raised by him was that of Dr. Robinson's Presbyterian Church of New York City, where $110,000 was raised at two meetings. And remember, this is pre-1900. This was 1875 to 1900. A lot of money to be raised very quickly at that time. Although not a remarkably eloquent speaker, the force and sincerity of Mr. Kimball's words gained success where oratorical efforts had failed. In this work that he did later in his life, no denomination or creed was favored. Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, Congregationalists were all treated alike. And it was while doing this work that he would pass away at the age of 78, having retained remarkably good health until the very end. Sadly, few know the name of Edward Kimball. They, they might know him in in passing as being the person who helped to lead Moody to Christ, but few know of the work that he would do for 25 years in helping churches to become debt-free, to not have that burden of, of debt hanging over them, so that they were free to focus on evangelizing and serving the church and the community. But sadly, so many articles about Edward Kimball are, are merely used as a jumping point to talk about, as mentioned earlier, that, that pathway that would lead from D.L. Moody to Billy Graham. and. You know, we pass over the fact that he was a, a Sunday school teacher, a debt reducer, someone who'd go into churches and help them reduce their debt. And those are ministries that are vital, are very important. And yet people like Edward Kimball are overlooked every day. I'm curious, do you have a story of a Sunday school teacher or someone who's doing a unique ministry in your church? There's many different ministries out there. Some you know, we don't think about uh, very often. You know, we think about the simple simple ones, you know, there's a preacher, a, a Sunday school teacher, someone who leads music, someone who plays a piano or another instrument, someone who runs sound, people who are missionaries. So if you know of someone who has an interesting ministry or has made an impact on you as a Sunday school teacher or a small group leader or something like that, would you tell me about it? There's two ways you can do that. One, you can send me an email to the link that's down below. Just write out, you know, doesn't have to be long, something short, telling me about that person or the ministry that they do. Or you can go on to Instagram, might be easier, and you can either write me a DM there, or you can use the voice feature and you can leave me a voice message about that person and what they did. And if we get enough of those, maybe we'll compile them into one big episode, which would be a lot of fun because there's so many people who are overlooked. I have a couple people in mind that there's not enough information to make a full story about, but that we could compile together and tell some short stories, some reminders of people who worked behind the scenes, they helped to promote the gospel gospel, but they stayed more in the background, more in the shadows, and very little is known about them. So if you have anyone like that, leave me the story in an email, or go to Instagram and send me a DM or a voicemail. But that's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to the God's Peculiar People podcast. I'll talk to you again next week.